Hi, I'm attorney Gregory Dell, and I'm joined today by attorney Stephen Jessup and attorney Cesar Gavidia. And today we're going to discuss the residual disability provision in a long-term disability policy. Now, these, po these provisions are usually found in an individual disability policy. And I want to first start with you, Caesar. If you could explain what is a residual disability provision in a long-term disability policy. Greg, uh, residual disability provisions are similar to or usually synonymous with partial disability provisions. Um, as you know, uh, policies have contain both total disability. If they contain the residual disability, they probably contain also total disability definition. And what it basically means or how most of them are defined is if you have a loss of the ability to perform one or more of the duties of your occupation or you're unable to work full time in your occupation and you suffer a loss of income as a result of it, then you're eligible for residual or partial disability benefits. Okay. And usually that loss of income is what, like at least a 20% loss of income? Usually it's a 20% loss. Every policy is a little different, but typically what we see out there is 20% loss of income. All right. Steve, if you could explain a little bit about what does a person need to do in order to prove that they're residually disabled? Well, I mean, it's, it's a two-fold step. A, you need to prove that because of the medical condition, you're limited from performing your duties or you're not doing it as often. And then there also has to be the, uh, the component with there's a financial loss attributed to the disability. Um, so it's, it's twofold. It's your medical and it's your financial. And then the evaluation from there you know, can get quite elaborate and quite complex as to how an insurance company is going to look at it. If you uh, own your own, you know, say it's a doctor with medical practice, or a business owner, or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, when they're taking a look at financial aspects, they're also going to take a look at, is there any other reason why maybe the practice isn't doing well, so all of a sudden they're claiming disability to cover the fact the practice is gone. So it's, it's really important to make sure that in whatever field you, you're in business-wise, your documentation is, is basically pretty pristine because they're going to ask for a lot of stuff along the way. Okay, so the just to summarize, the first part was the medical condition, and that's the same evaluation whether it's a total disability or residual disability, they're going to look mm -hmm. at the medical regardless. So for purposes of our discussion today, let's focus on the financial component. Mm -hmm. And what kinds of documents, Caesar, from your experience, could a claimant be expected to have to produce if they want to claim residual disability benefits? Right. Well, certainly the most obvious, the tax returns. They're going to ask for their um, personal tax returns, their corporate tax returns, they're going to ask for all the schedules, attachments to those. They're going to ask for the W-2s, um, uh, 1099s, Schedule Cs, all those things. Uh, they'll ask for the profit and loss statements from a business because what happens is even though you may submit these yearly tax returns, the analysis under these policies is a monthly analysis every single now, month. Now, you're speaking as if this is a business owner or a self-employed person right. that would have those kinds of things. Right, certainly, would have those things. Certainly a person who's an employee wouldn't have the P&Ls of a business. Right. Okay, so Where in, in that type of case, you'd get a W-2 or right. a 1099 or whatever, and you just show your, your income or your pay stubs, for instance, on a monthly basis. But, you know, going back to like, for instance, a business owner, they're going to show profit and loss statements. They may ask for their general ledgers. You know, they could ask for all sorts of documentation. Like Steve said, it's really important to make sure you, you have all that documentation in place or your CPA or accountant, whoever it is that, that is in charge of maintaining all those documents for you, have those things available, readily available. All right, now, Steve, a lot of people ask us, they say, look, when I bought the policy, they asked me for my tax returns. I understand I had to give them that. And they never asked me for all this other stuff like bank statements, invoices, uh, patient lists if you're a doctor, client lists if you're a contractor or whatever type of business you do, invoices if you're somebody who bills someone, receipts if you're someone who sells. Do they really have to give all these things? Well, you know, in a lot of ways, yeah, they do. Um, with the tax return, that's a conglomeration. Con conglomeration. That's a conglomeration <laughs> yeah. of all the documentation. But you have to be able to support where those numbers are going in. You can send it in, and the, the insurance companies have accountants who are going to go through. They're going to take a look, and they're saying, listen, something's not matching up right here with regards to the general ledger or the profit and loss statements. Where is the money coming from? Or if they think the person's, uh, you know, sometimes in profit and loss, you'll see all of a sudden a huge expense, an auto expense or computer expense, and the insurance company may think that that's being done to show a loss to get a requisite, you know, for it to get benefits under the policy. So even the bills, the backups for all those expenses, you know, those are all go into what will at the end of the day be the taxes. So the insurance company wants you to see the trail that led to those numbers to make sure that everything's above the boards. Okay, now people watching this might be saying like, wow, this seems like too much work. I don't want to 
get involved with this, but Caesar, what's the real, practically speaking, what are the requirements usually for most companies on a monthly basis that it, once you get approved for claim, you're, it's a residual claim, what usually does the disability carrier require just month to month? Right, I mean, for the person who's private, who's employed by a business, they'll ask for the pay stubs, okay? So on a monthly basis, they'll submit their bi-weekly pay stubs or whatever it is. Um, uh, for the business owner, they'll ask for the profit and loss statements. If they also have pay stubs, they'll have those. Uh, but typically, that's what we, we see on a monthly basis. Okay, and I think the stuff when we were talking about bank statements, invoices, receipts, all that other stuff, I think claimants have to be aware that if your claim gets denied, they're going to do, the disability company is going to do <clears throat> a full-blown audit of you in basically the litigation stage, or maybe even after they're denied at or prior to you being denied, they might ask for further detailed mm -hmm. information if they have reason to suspect some kind of unusual activity. So, you know, the message here from this video is you really should keep all that stuff, which you're probably doing in the normal course of business anyhow, because that's what the IRS requires, so therefore you should have that type of information. Now, a another thing, Steve, I want to ask you is residual disability. Do the companies average your annual earnings? Is it a month-to-month? Evaluation. What happens if you're in a business and one month you make a fifty thousand dollars sale and the next month you only have five thousand dollars in sales? Obviously, you don't have a loss of income in that big month. I think that's that's kind of left up in in some way to interpretation. Obviously, the insurance company is going to see uh, say you have two three good months in a row and they may say, well, there's no longer a requisite loss, so you must be recovering. Um, but the reality of it is, is just like a medical condition usually doesn't have a finite end; it continues to move on. Um, you know, maybe just that in our position, that given month, that person wouldn't be entitled because they had over the earnings um, for that month. But you're right, that, you know, you may have one big, you know, whether it be case or procedure, whatever is done that's going to pump your, uh, you know, your, your income up for that month. But it's a really a month to month analysis uh, each month whether or not there's going to be entitlement under it. Uh, under the policy. And I think some policies allow averaging and some just mm -hmm. say it's month to month and if you have a good month then you're going to get a lower benefit. If you have a bad month then you'll get a bigger benefit. Mm -hmm. But I really think you got to look specifically at the policy language in order to make that determination. And some policies now, uh, residual disability benefit riders will have for business owners pre-disability um, expenses so that they would cap at oh, what their cap. monthly expenses would be based upon what the average expenses were for a period of pre-disability, just like pre-disability earnings determination. Right, I think you see that in the principal disability uh, policies. Guardian rights policies that way too. And I think Guardian also has those averaging policies mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we've seen as well. Caesar, do you have cases where it's possible for someone to be residual and then total, or total and then residual? I have. I've actually had cases where um, it was contingent that the person be first totally disabled and then following uh, the period of total disability, the, the person could qualify for residual disability. So if that period of total disability never occurred, then the person would never qualify for residual disability. And all these policies are different. You know, so we've certainly seen cases like that. Right, I know uh, you guys know a case we just resolved for someone who called us who was on a total disability claim and he had been suffering for many years. He had cancer, he made a recovery, but he went back to work and he was always slow. He was always having difficulty getting back to his revenue level. When he had the cancer diagnosis, he was totally disabled. Then he went back to work. He was so happy to be cancer free or at least getting back to work that the carrier closed his claim. When he contacted us because he, unrelated to cancer, broke his wrist and couldn't do his job anymore, we looked at his claim and said, hey, why did they stop paying you they didn't even pay you residual benefits. You went from total to nothing. And we were able to determine for this particular client that he had a year and a half of residual disability benefits owed to him, which was about $100,000 that he was never compensated for because he didn't even realize that he was entitled to a residual claim. So I think a lot of people just think, if I can't work, I'm not entitled to anything and don't realize that they have this residual disability provision. So I know we just talked superficially about residual disability and there's lots of other issues that come up about pre-disability income and post-disability earnings. So I want to encourage our viewers that if you have a residual disability claim or you're not sure if you're total versus residual, feel free to call us for a free consultation. We've reviewed hundreds of residual disability claims. We're familiar with just about every single policy from every disability carrier and we'd be happy to offer you a free consultation and discuss your claim with you.